So the first thing I do is I throw my cups on a wheel. Normally I'm a hand builder, but uh, when, I throw, when I'm making cups, I prefer that they're thrown because I do want them to be a little more structured because I'm going, I go in and I kind of bind these and it doesn't work as well when I'm trying, when I hand build them. So I'm going to show you guys my throwing method. So I've got my ball of clay, throw it in the center. So of course you start with throwing uh, with your uh, wheel fully up to speed. Um, so at max speed, right? I am working directly on the wheel head because I know it's level. I, I have to admit, I am not fond of bats. <laughs> I usually throw directly on the wheel head um, because I have to admit, I'm not the like greatest thrower in the world. So um, I'm not great at having to then manipulate if the bat is wonky. So I much prefer to work on something that I know is level. So the first thing I do is I go ahead and seal this to the wheel, right? And I put my hands in the back back here. And I actually, when I'm working, I kind of tilt myself a little to the side so that I can put my elbow directly into my hip bone. And so that when I'm centering, I'm actually centering with my entire form. It helps me center easier when I do this, this way. And then, so I do coning up and down um, the reason I do this is go ahead. What it does is, one, it moves all the clay around, um, helps kind of get rid of some air pockets or air bubbles, kind of moves them to the surface. But it also actually wets your clay as you're throwing to the interior. So where I don't end up when I put my finger on the inside when I go to make a donut, that I end up with. Uh, shifting my clay while it's on the wheel. It's actually getting moist all the way through. And so I will go ahead and start some of my story. So I actually did not get into ceramics until I was in college. Um, I had always been a drawer and a painter. I had been doing or drawing and painting since I was two years old. My mother told me that she uh, gave me a pencil one day just to keep me entertained and uh, she couldn't pry it out of my hands. And so now uh, when I got to college, I had decided to go ahead and be a drawing and painting major that I needed something new. And I ended up going into printmaking, um, which is very close to drawing and painting, but I call it drawing and painting on steroids, right? Because there's, there's all of these like, um, nuances and uh, different uh, things you have to do following the drawing and painting aspect, right? And so when I did the drawing and paint, when I got into printmaking, it kind of opened up an entirely different world for me. And so when I, I ended up studying abroad in Italy and it was there that I went to um, and saw like so many sculptures. I had become so obsessed with three-dimensional work while I was there. And in, what I decided to do was come home and take a ceramic uh, class, not a ceramics class. I came home to decide to take a sculpture class. Sculpture was full, ceramics was the only three-dimensional medium left. And so I signed up for the class like, oh gosh, this is gonna be horrible. Um, and I have to admit that when because my mom had put me in a ceramics class when I was in like fifth grade and I hated it because I would come home with like what I felt like was dirt under my nails and that would drive me nuts. And so I was like, oh, I'm gonna hate this going to take this ceramics class. But immediately I knew I had found the art medium for me. <laughs> and so in that uh, very crazy strangeness of loving something that you failed at, um, I dived into ceramics wholeheartedly and I couldn't find myself doing anything different. And so what I just did was opened up my clay. I just pushed my finger down to the interior. I create what's called a bear claw and I drag my finger out um, until the, the important part is not to drag it beyond your base. If you drag it beyond your base, you have weakened your side walls and you end up with a mess later because then you're trying to pull up and you end up pulling your entire piece off. 
So you never want to drag wider than your base. In fact, you want to stop a good bit further into the interior. And so what I'm going to do now is compress the bottom of my piece because what this does is keep my bottom hopefully from splitting. That doesn't always work, let's say that. But this is going to try to ensure that it doesn't split. I usually finish off my, my last compression, which is just a little bit of pressure down and over from just one side to the center. You don't go over here because you start doing weird things and you mess up your bottom. So don't do that, okay? So from here, I will go ahead and start um, lifting ever so slightly. What I do when I'm throwing is actually throw towards the interior. Now you see, I still have my wheel at, wheel at full speed. I do that just for my initial push to get myself to the center. And then I go ahead and slow my wheel down. I slow my wheel down, but then I also compress my top two, right? The way I'm doing this is kind of having my fingers on the interior here and the exterior. I'm not actually pinching my clay. It's ever so slightly just touching it. And then I push down with a flat finger, not a weird finger, flat finger, okay? <laughs> it, it makes a difference, I promise, okay? So now that I've done that, I'm gonna start pulling up and you'll see how I go about doing that. Um, so back to my story. So pieces fell apart, very excited to be in a medium that was gonna make me crazy for the rest of my life. And what I knew um, I wanted to do was go ahead and tell stories. So I'm a storyteller anyway. I have always been inclined to tell stories. And this I discovered was the perfect medium for me to do it because it could be manipulated into anything. I could make pottery, I could make sculptures. I could do just about anything. I got to mimic anything I wanted that was in this world. And I thought that was incredible. And so um, I had in printmaking had been making work at this point, by this point, um, that was very dark in nature. And what I needed to do was to kind of tell, get things off of my chest. That's what I was doing. I needed to to free my own spirit. And I have to admit that I didn't, I couldn't do that before doing ceramics. Ceramics really taught me how to learn to let go of things. And that's very difficult for me. I don't like letting things go. <laughs> but when you open a kiln and something blew up or you, oops, open, the kiln and your piece, like the glaze on it is horrible, right? I'm gonna cut this off. It got a little thin right at the top. And so my clay is just about there. It's just about thin enough at the bottom. The top here is definitely thin enough. And I will say that no matter what, if you're just thinning out the bottom and you're not thinning out your top, you finish a pull all the way through. You never stop in the middle. <laughs> you don't leave some weird wonky thing happening. You always finish that pull. And you'll notice the difference. I've got like a little air pocket right at this top here that I don't want. So I'm gonna cut it off. Perfect. And so I still work with my um, clay kind of flat at the top. And then I come down here and I start shaping my form. So I have learned to cut off using just like my little baby fingernails. And I've discovered not everybody has like these really sharp pointed fingers like I do. Um, so, so there are tools that help you with that. Um, but I have luckily really sharp fingertips. And so it helps me kind of just cut it without all these tools. And so I had to learn to work with the bare minimum. And that's kind of, I think, why I ended up being more of a hand builder than a thrower, because for a very long time, I didn't have a wheel. And I still needed to make, I couldn't not make. So um, I ended up diving into hand building more. Okay, so at this point, what I like to do before I start shaping this is I like to go ahead and clean up my sides. Because at this point, 
I've got my the basic form that I want, sort of. I'm gonna change it, but I won't need to touch my outside anymore, so. Ashlyn, are you slowing ahead. down your wheel just a little bit? I did, I did slow down my wheel a little bit because I, I'm gonna, ch I will chop right through this with this tool. You know, like I will slice and dice. And so I, I'm heavy handed and I know it. And so I, if I don't slow things down, I'm cutting right through something. I don't need it to be perfectly smooth because honestly, part of like the pleasure for me of doing throwing is that you see kind of like the throwing rings, you see the action of what I've done. Okay, so I don't like to like make this the smoothest. I like it this way. So I leave those little tiny rings right in there. So now at this point, I like to shape. I just use my bare hands really because I like to create what's more like a female form where it begins to bubble out at the bottom and get wider. So all I'm doing is starting at the very bottom and I ever so slightly start to lift my fingers up to push out. And I am pushing out, I am giving it some pressure, but it's a very slight pressure because the clay is really soft because now it's full of water, right? So you wanna make sure you're, you're one, going slow, don't push too hard. Um, I thinned out my walls just enough to know that when I pushed out, I wouldn't make my walls super thin. Okay, so you want to leave it a little thicker than your finished product. So when you push out, it's not super small. Um, so I usually shape this top just a little bit, not much. And you'll see why it almost doesn't matter, but it kind of does a little bit too. So I double, not too big. And I then like to kind of shape my rim a little bit. Um, so remember I started off with something flat. I don't like flat because it feels funny on the lip when you are putting a cup to your mouth. So you wanna actually round out the edges. Now there's a multiple ways you can think of the lip, right? You can round out the edges like I'm doing, or you can come in and create more of a V on the interior that then you smooth out just ever so slightly. And it's nice because, you know, when our lips pucker, we've got that little V shape for our lips in between our two lips. So it fits ever so nicely in that space. And those little details, I promise you, will matter. Okay, so either round it off or create that little V in cut. And I just kind of held it to uh, the interior and kind of pushed down ever so slightly so that it created that that uh, 45 degree angle on the interior. So at this point, like I said, I don't really touch my outside too much either like with my fingers, but I actually stop here and I bind my cups. So the reason why I bind my cups is because my work is actually about talking about black experiences. And through, I, am talking about the experiences and I am re re well talking about it through time. All of the experiences are different, but there was there's one thing that's really in common and it's feeling bound and restricted um, as a black body in America. And so I needed to talk about those experiences across time. And so I've learned to bind my cups and I do them while they're wet literally just thrown, I come across and I bind the cup and I drop them down. This thing gets crazy, so don't mind it. And I kind of ever so slightly kind of push into the clay so that it kind of stays in there. Because then what I need to do is I actually need to push out my form even more just along those edges. So I come in and I start billowing out this form. And in the process of billowing out my form, what I actually end up with, 
is it looking like it's bound? Okay, so you see like it starts to change its shape from this billow. And so I like playing with materials. Materials mean everything to me. Rope made sense to me. And so I use it to talk about that binding. And so I then pull my rope off. And I end up with the texture of it bound, but then also feeling like it's caught in the binding, right? Where it wants to break free from it, but it can't. Okay. So that is my binding method. Now, you see, if you can see, my top is a little wonky, and I'll see how it's no longer like straight. Um, usually, I don't care. <laughs> That doesn't matter to me. We're all like, I feel like being a bound body, you're, you're meant to be, you're meant to show the restriction and the misshapen. And it doesn't need to be perfect because humanity is not perfect. So I kind of just come in and smooth out the rim. So it's, it's nice against the mouth still. But that's it. Like if it becomes an oval, I let it stay an oval. I don't go and try to re-manipulate it into anything else because the binding what was was the most important. Okay, so that is a bound cup. And now we're going to switch over and move to me talking about um, my decoration methods. Earlier in the chat, I posted a link to Ashlyn's website. She's posted some um, finished examples of the cups she's demonstrating tonight. I encourage you to check out her website because not only are her cups on there and beautifully photographed, but also some of her past works. So this is one of the cups. And then what I do is once it, it has stiffened up enough, I go ahead and flip it and I trim the bottom so they're round. Okay, so I don't actually trim feet into these. And the reason I don't do that is because when what I think is important is then having a reason why you have selected the thought, the pieces that you've made. Like if you're gonna trim a foot into it, do more or understand it more than just it being a necessary item for the piece to stand up. And so what I have decided to do is that um, I use this chance in my cups to make what are called sweet grass coils. And so what these coils for me are, these lovely, let me grab some clay and I'm going to show you how I make them. Um, what they are for me is a expression of my culture. What I'm, I'm doing is taking these sweet grass coils in order to talk about my ancestry. So my family's Gullah. And so in this process, you guys will watch me uh, make a sweet grass coil really quickly, okay. Um, and I am Gullah, which is a African ex-slave culture from the Southeast, uh, which is like, you'll see a lot of gold people from South Carolina, uh, bottom of North Carolina, uh, Georgia, and the top of Florida. Um, uh, coastal region. So our family's from what we call, my family's from the low country of South Carolina, which is right near the coast, about 40 minutes outside of Charleston. Um, but what makes this me have this culture or what makes this culture important is that it is one of the last surviving ex-slave communities that um, still has a lot of traditions steeped in um, African, with African roots that still has a lot of African traditions. And the reason why it is very important, or at least why I think it's very important, um, is that we still have, a, we have a distinct culture, we have a distinct language, we have arts, but what's important about the way all of that was formed is that you're surrounded by bogs and you're surrounded by water and in a location where hurricanes are constantly hitting, um, what would happen is uh, slave masters would go inland during hurricane season and leave all of their slaves to till land. 
And so what they were doing when the slave master left is that they practice all of their African heritage. So they ended up not losing a bunch of it because like six months out of the year, no one's around to force you to forget. And so um, the culture is really beautiful. Um, but anyway, these sweet grass uh, baskets came about because you use sweet grass baskets in order to harvest rice. You put them in, they have enough uh, space between them that water will fall through, but it will collect the rice itself. And so um, my ancestors were bought in order to, bought to these lands in order to harvest the rice. Um, because in the certain countries in Africa, they already had an entire history with um, binding grass in order to make these sweet grass baskets in order to harvest rice. And so they, they have become some of the most beautiful baskets turned into pure art now that har rice isn't harvested by people in the same manner as they used to, right? Um, but they are now these just beautiful art baskets in particular um, tied to the Gullah culture. And so I use these in order to kind of reclaim that history, to take that history on and to be elevated by my ancestors. And that is why these cups that are looking and talking about black and brown bodies, my sweet grass bottom feet is the elevation. It is what sustains me, it's what holds me, it what keeps me. And so they are the things that sit at the bottom of this, or these pieces. And so what I'm doing is I rolled out a coil, I then go ahead and score my entire coil all the way around. Don't cheat. Can't just score one side. It'll be noticeable. Okay, so I, I get this all scored up and I'm using those to have conversations about binding. I'm letting it be reflected throughout the entire body of the piece from the bound cup to the bound coils. But it's in, it, I, what I like is the conversation between binding the cup itself and it being visual of a, a black body bound, which is so negative to a cultural binding, which is so positive. And so you're getting kind of these two actions or these two ideas in one, one uh, motion with this idea of binding. Okay, so now that this is scored, um, I kind of set these to the side. I make a lot of these at one time. Um, I will say that is a it is a very time consuming uh, method. It takes for me to roll about 30 coils the size of this board, right, to this size. It takes me about four hours to make about 30 of them. So it is a very long time but I always find it to be totally worth it. Um, if you go on my website, you will see that I make them and put them on vases as well as cups. So the, the cups are nice because it usually only takes about one of these to uh, make the bottom of my cups, but a vase, it takes about like between 30 and 40. So I could easily be sitting there for hours just kind of rolling these things up. So you saw that I rolled a larger coil, right, to score. I rolled a lot smaller of a coil and I flatten it. And now when they're this long, you don't wanna start from here and try to roll this this way because you're only gonna end up with these little like wavy things happening and you don't want it to be wavy. So I usually start from the middle and I roll backwards and then I roll forwards and I can keep my line very straight, okay? I won't show you the other method because just, just, just don't do it, okay? Stay away from it, it's not worth it, trust me. <laughs> You'll be very sad that you've got a very squiggly line. Okay, so once I've done that, I usually then come in and I have some just water, help it stick to my piece. So I don't, I can't score this. It's just too thin, 
too fragile. It's just not going to work. So this was the best method I found in order to get a texture that'll help it stick. And so it's just the canvas texture on the back of it. And I just kind of slip it with some water. I do not slip the whole thing because what happens is by the time I get down here, it's so dry, like, or at least the water, the dampness has disappeared. And I really end up having to wet it again. And then this just becomes a whole sticky mess. Don't work, don't do that to yourself. Um, so I roll as much as I can with it still shiny. And I only slip as, or put water on as much as I can that I know will still be shiny when I go to roll it. So I've gotten to the part where now I need to add more water. And it's very little water. It is not a lot. Do not, you, it's going to be a sticky mess. Trust me, don't do it. Very little. And so I didn't say this in the beginning, but I'll say it on the next one. Um, when I'm rolling this, I'm rolling it on a 45 degree angle. My main coil is staying straight. So you see it has stopped right there. So I need to pick up and I'm going to show you that pickup. I will also say if you don't have like the greatest canvas in the world, do not roll your very tiny coil on that canvas because it's releasing hairs and it's getting caught and it's gonna just keep slicing through all of your piece. Do not roll it on that. Get yourself a board and roll it separately. Now, I like to roll all of my bigger coils at one time because then I can see if they're consistent size. And then um, I like to roll at least a couple of these so that I can make sure these are set in consistent in size as well. So I would never just do one of these at a time. I try to make it streamlined because I get, I know me, like it just doesn't, it's not gonna work. Maybe you have a lot more patience than I do. I don't, I don't have it. I tried to have it, it doesn't work. I've, I've moved on from trying to be patient. Once again, put this on a 45. I overlap it just a bit and then I start the roll and then I can blend it in over the overlap and put make that overlap become one. And so once I get to the bottom, I have an exacto blade somewhere. I just go ahead and cut it off on an angle. How I end it really doesn't matter. And the reason is, is cause I, um, end up cutting off like my ends anyway. So how it really finishes doesn't necessarily matter. Awesome. Okay, so let's let's move on. Let's move forward. How, what I do next is I actually then attach my coil to my foot, make it my foot ring. Let's make sure I got you in a good spot so you can see, there we go. Um, and the way I go about doing that is the banding wheel. So this one's a pretty round opening cause it's a small guy. It was pretty easy to keep it pretty round. I, keep, I put it as close as I can to the middle in the middle where it's absolutely gonna need to be centered. Doesn't matter to me. I'm going to get it to stand up either way. So what I do is I kind of just take uh, a marking tool. I usually use my uh, needle tool to do this, but I don't have it over here with me at the moment. So I am not going to get up and interrupt this, but I like to go ahead and kind of spin it and just see if it's somewhere in the vicinity of middle. When it's not doing some weird off the wonky path, then I'm in a good light. So I kind of hold it down and I hold my hand very steady. And I ever so slightly just mark something that looks like the center. <laughs> something really close to a center makes me happy. Um, I don't need it to be a perfect circle because the sweet grass bottom is not a perfect coil. I don't worry about it being perfect. It's gonna look decently perfect. And, and then I score my very bottom. And I love this tool. This is my favorite tool, okay? 
it's got all of these little needle like points to it, which lets me get to very small spaces and stay very controlled. And I love it. So this is the one that gets the most use. Um, and it becomes really important when adding this bottom that I stick to that line because I am not going to go in and like crazy smooth out around it. So if I can contain that um, well beforehand, I have less cleanup later. I, like I said, have very little patience. Okay. So I don't want to have to go back in and clean this up like crazy. It's just going to make me nuts and sad. So um, once I've done that, I then use oh, this way, um, a squeeze bottle full of my slip. Um, my slip recipe is basically um, like a paper clay because I had found that if I was doing this or trying to add these sweet grass pieces while um, with just regular slip, like clay and water, right? It, they wouldn't, they would part, they would want to separate from one another. So the uh, fibers inside of the toilet paper actually kind of help this bind a little better. It helps with shrinkage. And so I'm very grateful, but I put it in a squeeze bottle because I want to stay along that line as much as possible. And so this was just like a regular hair. Like I said, I don't, I try not to spend a whole bunch of money on tools. If I can find something else that works, I'm gonna use it. And so this is a hair dyeing bottle. And I just went in, went, I keep, my hands are never gonna be in the right place, guys. I'm so sorry. So um, what I did is snip the top off so it was a little lower that I could squeeze a little more out than I would if it was just a regular slip trailing bottle that you would buy. So now once I've gotten this on here, or gotten my slip on there, I take my coil. I am not using the coil that we just made because it's a little soft. I'm going to use one that I rolled a little earlier in order to put this on. It's still really bendable, but it's it's a little stiffer than fresh, okay? What I do is I cut a 45 degree angle on the edge. I cut a 45 degree angle on my edge so that I can um, easily place this down without creating a weird hump, but I score it. I do not score my coil because my coil is already scored. I push it down into my slip mixture and start tracing it along the very bottom. I always preferred it. It, looked, it looks better to me to have it as two rings at the bottom. So then what I do is then I'm gonna come in and slip this as well. But I like the V shape. I'm a 45 degree angle girl. I don't know why it became that, but it is. And so I like to also have my um, exterior um, coil or my top coil slightly offset so that it creates another 45 degree angle. <laughs> So I actually add my slip just a little off to the side. So that I'm creating, we're going to be putting this um, further over, right? Get that on there. And then I just lift it up. And now I'm attaching once again, like I said, offset to the side a little bit on the outside edge. I've tried it other ways. I just didn't like it as much. So I think I'll always, uh, or at least generally for now, <laughs> stick to this 45 degree angle look. It makes me happy. And so as I get to the edge where I'm about to rise up and do the third one, I kind of track my edge ever so slightly. And I go ahead and cut it. When I go to put this on, it'll just lean down ever so nicely to fit that angle or to fit that rise. And so I do score it. I do add a little slip to that so that it can attach. And I push down. Now you cannot, or I cannot anyway, um, push too much on the sweet grass coils because then I'll lose all of my texture. 
So I have learned to have very slight hands, um, but it does happen. And so when that does occur, I just come in and I re scratch where necessary, wherever my finger kind of got rid of a lot of that detail, I just put it back in. And so I end up with a bottom that looks like that. And when it sits or from the side, you see, now it's got like this cute little rise to it, okay? So one more thing that I think about is whether or not something needs a handle. Uh, generally, I would not put a handle on something like this, but I'm just gonna show you how I make a handle. I won't put it on, I'm just gonna show you how I make it. The cup that I threw earlier with you guys, I would put a handle on, generally. <laughs> Let's go with generally, because sometimes I don't. It's not something that I'm, I'm totally tied to. Me and, me and handles um, have a love-hate relationship. So I hand build my handles because I'm not the greatest of pullers. Um, I definitely need more practice. I need like a thousand more pulls on a, on a handle before I get a good handle. But right now, um, I don't have time for that. And so I've learned to hand build one that I, I appreciate. And so the first thing I do is I go ahead and I give myself a straight line. And I, and I, I work with X-Acto blades too quite a bit. Me and X-Actos are friends. We like each other. I did not give myself a straight line. Pardon me as I give myself a new one. And then from there, I start to mark um, my handle. So I don't do them where they are completely the same size all the way down. They should get a little smaller at the end. Now, whether I use or on one of the sides and you could put the, the fatter side at the top or the fighter side at the bottom and have the thinner at the top versus the bottom. That's all an aesthetic choice, but they should be different sizes. Okay. This space or this opening is not a great opening for something at over an inch wide. Okay, or an inch wide, it should be smaller because when our fingers wrap around that to grip the handle, you want it to feel soft in the hand, something more subtle, not something that you're like having to figure out how to hang on to. So it should be smaller than an inch at the top. And so I usually do mine about uh, three fourths of an inch. And then I end up with at the bottom about a half inch to like six eighths of an inch. I know that sounds quite specific, but long as your top is a little wider and your bottom's a little smaller, whatever size you decide to work with is up to you. But as you can see, I'm working with a wider top and a smaller bottom and it's slight right? It's not this huge difference, but it does make a difference visually. So if you are going to do it, think about doing it in a way that is going to get you something quite pleasant, okay? And so then what I do is I take a piece of plastic, so slightly just kind of lay it down, and I actually then on the sides start pushing down on my sides to kind of round out my sides. Because like I said, we're thinking about the shape of this part of the hand. So that wants to be a little rounded, right? Okay. So you want that rounded. Um, the thickness that I work with for my um, handle is usually about, so I roll out a coil or roll out a slab, as you could see. And so the thickness I usually work with is about, um, a little bit thicker than a quarter of an inch, just a little bit. And so now I'm just looking for a consistent smoothness around this piece. And then when I peel it off, it's smooth on all sides. You see it starts to drop down on those edges so that I have a really great item that's gonna sit in my hand ever so nice. I'm going to turn it right way. There we go. Ever so nicely. <laughs> so 
is kind it's already a little stiffer because I've let this set up a little bit. I would create like a candy cane and let it stiffen up just a little bit more to attach to my piece, okay? Um, however, where you decide to cut it is based on visually what looks great for your the size of your mug um, and what's gonna hold that weight well. And so normally if I'm doing something on this size, this would be a lot smaller of a handle. Like I wouldn't do something this big, right? Like this is just giant and makes no sense. So you would wanna play with something that's smaller and fits the shape of your cup, okay? So yay. Okay, we are in a, a position where we are gonna go ahead and start decorating. Um, so when I'm thinking about decorating a cup, um, I play into color color is important, but I don't like to cover up my color, um, my brown clay as well, because my clay fired actually looks like this color as well. So it's got this rich chocolatey brown, luscious surface that I absolutely adore and hate to get rid of. And so instead what I do um, is think about color in a different light. And in that way, I also draw from Gullah culture. Um, I like things that have a meaning. And so um, I always come into this um, decoration with that in mind. And so um, one thing I like to do is paint different colors on the surface. I usually stick between blue, black, in the color of the clay. I know, terrible, but <laughs> but that's usually the, the colors that I stick to. Um, and the reason I like the black is because honestly, I am just obsessed with the black velvet from Amico. Like there's just something so luscious and happy to me about this black that I can't get rid of it from my life. But then I think about like um, also the range of colors of black skin, right? So it also kind of plays into that too. Um, but I picked the blue, this, this kind of turquoise, aqua-ish blue, um, because in Gullah culture, there's this color we call haint blue. Haint blue is um, a protective color. It is used to talk about um, keeping evil spirits away from you. And so uh, the way this color was handled in a Gullah culture is they either paint the ceilings of their uh, front porches with this color. Um, they also used bottles, um, blue bottles. I don't know why, but they used blue bottles. I don't know what's with the glass, but um, they, would, they would stick them on the trees that were in the front of their house in order to capture the spirits. And the reason of the blue is because in, you know, I told you we were a coastal culture. And so the idea is that if you see the blue, you get disoriented and you will leave and go back out to sea. So you won't actually be able to enter into the house or into um, a personal space where um, our bodies are located, but you were now dissipated. And so I use my blues in here for those exact reasons. And um, so I'm gonna show you what I do as well here. Um, so sometimes I come in and I add slip and I like texturized slip, right? I don't like this super thin stuff. I like this idea of um, giving it some body uh, because what I do is I decorate these in cotton and I know I had just told you guys that uh, my family harvested rice. <laughs> and so it's like, why cotton, right? Um, my grandmother, when she was a child, and now my grandmother is only 72. When she was a child, six years old, she used to be in the field picking cotton. And so she explained what it was like to have bloody fingertips at six years old from reaching in the pods and getting your fingers stuck. And she had little fingers, she was a child. And so she experienced what it was like to, to pick cotton. And so cotton to me hits closer to home because it is more present to my experiences now than necessarily my ancestors picking rice. Um, but I still use rice <laughs> in my imagery sometimes. Um, we also worked with indigo um, as well as tobacco. And so uh, I play with all of those different crops um, as well in my work. Um, so 
made a little cotton piece, um, but I also like to doodle cotton everywhere. <laughs> You'll watch me doodle too. So um, I use slip trailing bottles for this one. Um, this is a really thin gauge. I believe it's the 18 gauge. I think it's the larger the number, the smaller the tip. And so this is an 18 gauge so I can slip trail under glaze. So something really thin. Um, but then I also have 16 gauges, which are a little wider and can release more um, material. And so I use actual slip for this because you know, slip is a lot thicker. You could totally thin out slip too, but I use it thicker and use underglaze um, thinner. And so what I go ahead and do, um, I go ahead and I start trailing cotton or imagery of cotton. So I go ahead and first do a little test run, right? I just run it across something else to make sure I can get a good squeeze on it without creating a huge blob when I first start. And I just kind of draw. Now, I told you I was a drawing and painting person. Well, guess what? That doesn't always come out across these items that I make. Um, but that's because I, I prefer to have it to be scratchy lines. Cotton shouldn't be clean and beautiful um, because it, it's an organic material. It should be wavy and distorted. And so I go in and I start trailing along my bodies here. Um, and I usually use cotton the most. It's organic nature. And it makes me really happy. And I use cotton as the bowl, cotton bowls, cotton buds, and uh, stems ever so much in my work. So as you can see, then I start creating it like a pattern. And the reason I end up doing like a pattern is because, strangely enough, I also have a fashion degree. And I love fabric. Fabric makes so much sense to me, but it's a world that I hated competing in. Like I could not stand like the viciousness that came along with being in fashion. And so instead I had um, just decided to use and work with fabric in the way that I thought it was going to be uh, the most effective for me. And so I make a lot of quilts um, alternative quilts. They're not regular quilts, I have to admit. Um, but my grandmother taught me how to make my first quilt. And she is not overly hateful of the fact that I don't make them traditional anymore, that I only make them um, my way. She doesn't get mad at me. She still, she still loves me. And so, um, that's why I end up creating these pieces. And I stop shy of my binding lines because I want those to be ever present. So I treat them in spaces like I'm quilting, but we are quilted by the binds. Ashlyn, this seems like such a natural spot to mention your classes that you're teaching in the winter spring that are directly connected to your background working in fashion and with textiles and with quilts. So yes, I am <laughs> taking <laughs> uh, classes in the winter and the spring um, where we are going to be working with materials, but materials that we then turn into quilts in the spring. So the first session is basically we're building up material so I will teach things like um, screen printing on fabric where you're making your own fabric. An alternative quilt to me is really about defining what the quilt is, which is just like three layers, right? Um, put together with like, it's a back piece of fabric, a, a center stuffing, and then a top piece of fabric. But then you, what happens when you start to play with that, right? What happens when you start adding beads? What happens when you start adding wire? What happens if you decide not even to use fabric, but you use something like watercolor paper that you've painted images on and quilted together? Like, 
what happens when you start to, to break the idea of a quilt um, and create art pieces, wall pieces instead, things that become more like tapestries. And so the first class <laughs> is about the materials and put making all of these items. And then the second half of the class um, is about actually making the quilts, which would be the spring class. Did I do a good job, Kyla? You did a fantastic job. And I have to say, this is the first time we have ever offered that I, that I, since I've been here, like two classes back to back over the course of two different sessions that really are like, they build on each other in this way. Um, I think it's a unique opportunity and a really exciting thing for us to try to see, see what comes out of it. And also capitalize on Ashland's incredible range of skills and expertise. So I'm excited about it. <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, it should it should be a really fun class. And then um, I think it will be nice to to let you also know that you don't necessarily need to be in both classes like you can sign up just for the materials class and never take the quilting class or you can sign up just for the quilting part and never take the materials so you don't necessarily have to be tied to either or it's just i wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity to see it all the way through and so it's 16 weeks of seeing it all the way through just saying so <laughs> and hanging out with ashlyn <laughs> and hanging out with me i think i might be fun <laughs> so come hang out with me if you like. Um, so what I just finished doing, guys, is slip trailing my black on all of my spaces here. But then I don't actually just slip trail with underglaze. And so when I'm thinking when I slip trail with underglaze, I'm thinking about tattoos. And so um, what I'm now going to do is slip trail on top of all of this with my um, slip which is more three-dimensional so the slip is flat and will soak into itself into the surface while slip will remain with a texture on the surface and the reason why i think about slip on the surface is because i'm thinking about um like lashes and i'm thinking about scarification i'm thinking about my ancestors with whips on their backs and what kind of marks that left but then I'm also thinking about when in Africa, um, many tribes use scarification for beautification. And so it's also got this dual meaning, which is really intense, but it's really, it could be really dark, but really beautiful at the same time. So I love duality, if you have not noticed. <laughs> I like things to mean many things um for me to to work with and so i just slip trail directly on top of this and i don't do it directly over the same pattern because i want different parts to peek through um because i like to think about graffiti and the walls that i would see growing up on the east coast of like time and you're watching energy moving through all of this graffiti put on the wall at different times. And so I like a really busy surface. Sometimes busy is a little too much, but then sometimes like it's really necessary and should be on a piece. And I think that ranges based on how I'm feeling that day, whether or not I really need it to be busy or if I need something more subdued and solitude with a little more solitude behind it. Um, because I will say making these cups is an, takes an emotional toll on me. As much as I love to do them, it's weighty. And so, because what I'm doing is I'm binding, to me, I'm binding black bodies. And it's really hard for me to then take this rope, tie them up and then to undo them. I find more solace in undoing it, but then I see all of the scars I've left. And that that and it, so it's an emotional toll it takes. And so every one of these pieces is a piece of me when I finish them. And so I and I think that to me at least is really important. They are definitely more on the, the level of a limited edition or limited editions than anything because it does take a lot out of me to do them. But I love doing them. I think they're important pieces that that get a chance to be and exist in a new world in your world. 
<laughs> so um, I, I do love doing them, but they, they are weighty. They are weighty. And so as you can see here, there's a texture that gets built up. And so if you, not now, but if you run your hands across them later, you got a three-dimensional effect, okay? And so I feel like we're getting close and I'll, I'll just show you guys, our, what time are we at, Marlo? Because I don't want to overwhelm. Okay, okay. I'll do a little bit more of this really quickly. And then um, I can show you finished products of what they look like done. And I would love to take questions if you guys are open to asking. Ashlyn, <laughs> how do you navigate the fact that a lot of your work is so heavy in content, but we've talked in studio visits about the importance of hope and that you don't want it to be all dark and all so challenging, but that you want it, you want there to be a sense of hope along with the dark, I think is what you told me. Yes. So how do you do that when, how do you reconcile that when you're making these pieces that are so, I mean, they're, they're heavy. Mm -hmm. They're dealing with a heavy, hard, challenging history with, with heavy, hard, challenging concepts. How right. do you, how do you do that? And how do you manage like, or how do you navigate that, I guess? Um, navigate it in my choices or personally? I think personally, but also your choices, I think would be interesting because I know, I, or from our conversations, like you really think about how to make sure that it's not totally heavy handed in the work itself. Right. Um, so the way I navigate that is honestly, is just making something beautiful. <laughs> I think because what happens is it's like, I know all of this history is behind this. I know what every ounce of this piece means from the choices of the clay to the decoration, but that does not necessarily always come across to the viewer or the user. And so you have the ability just to look at this piece and be like, that is just a beautiful object. And I think that's where the lightness comes from, where the hope comes from. I think when you sit with it long enough, you be then begin to go, oh, that's cotton. Oh, it's on a black body. Oh, it's got all these other things attached to it. But initially, all you get is the beauty and the hope that comes from it, because that's the first thing you see. Our experience, experience doesn't actually come from um, necessarily looking at something immediately and catching it. It comes from sitting with it. And so um, that's what I think is important and why I make them aesthetically like these really beautiful pieces, but then they also have all of these symbols in them to point you to the darker history that's behind them. And um, I work with it to talk about the history in particular, because it's something I don't want forgotten. It's not necessarily like I want to throw it in anyone's face. It's not never been about that. It's just like, this is knowledge of our history and it's been wiped over so much. It's been smoothed out, but it is ugly and it is rough or in a beautiful package <laughs> to talk about never forgetting. Ashlyn, I have stopped and looked at some of your work and commented how beautiful some of it is. I have a whole new appreciation for it now as you explain uh, everything behind your work. Uh, question that I do have is what clay body are you using that it keeps that beautiful color when it's fired? Uh, so my clay body, I actually have it mixed with my, re my own recipe, um, but it is very close to a Yixing clay body. It just so, keeps that gorgeous brown color. Uh, it does. Um, so this is the finished product. So you can actually see it is basically exactly the same. So you see, it's basically the same. So you can see, like I play with texture and color. And so I work with a lot of the red too, because I'm thinking about fresh cuts, fresh scars as well. Um, so this one is one with just the clay body color itself. But then 
I play with black. And I'm thinking about the dots as like the, the dots on African skin from a lot of tribal cultures. Um, and then also this one's more like the graffiti one where it's layered on top with imagery where you've got the black and then the white lines over top of it. And then I even sometimes go in and I do scraffito, as you can see, across that body. Oh, that one's beautiful. Oh yeah, they just take me a long time. But I love it. But yeah, I do them, I do them less often because I, I love carving. It just takes me forever. And so it, it tacks on at least another half an hour to 45 minutes for me to carve. And so I just, meh, less time. <laughs> Well, and these are truly labors of love in so many ways. They really are. It's a lot of mental labor of love, I promise. Yes. So if you ever decide to end up with one of these, know that it is my, if you end up with hopes and dreams encased in a cup. Okay. Oh, Ashlyn, that's so poetic and gorgeous. <laughs> Kyla, would you post the website again? I'm sorry. I will. I am happy to do that. I'm going to actually keep doodling on here because we, we, if you don't know, slip has to be put on while the clay still has a good bit of moisture in it. Because if it doesn't, it starts to do some weird cracking that's just not very pleasant to the eye. And so I'm just gonna keep trailing, but I'm listening. If you've got questions, I'm here to answer them. Yeah, I spend a lot of time doing a lot of this slip trailing. I've got, I have to admit though, I've gotten pretty pretty quick at it. I'm proud of myself. Ashlyn, you've talked about um, including the Magnolia theme in a lot of your pieces. And I think I saw some on a finished piece there. Can you talk a little bit more about that? So magnolias, okay, one, my favorite flower of all time. <laughs> um, but I think it became my favorite flower when I first had heard, and so I lived in Georgia too. So I should explain that too. Um, so I, I lived in the South for about 13 years, moved there my senior year in high school. And so um, it really ended up having a, like a profound effect on me because I honestly didn't understand racism until I moved to Georgia. And so um, a lot of my experiences in the South were not some of the greatest or the most beautiful things to have occurred to me or have happened to me. And so I had heard one time um, Billie Holiday's song, Strange Fruit, and it, it kind of gut punched me. And so, there, she's got this one line in the song where she's like, um, the scent of magnolias and then the sudden smell of burning flesh. And that, di that dichotomy, that, that pairing of words to create a visual just kind of hit me so hard. And so, I, and then I smelled one. And then I didn't know what to do with that, with that, sense of like her song and the words she had said with that smell. And so strangely enough, it became my favorite flower. Obviously I'm attached to the very strange side of life, right guys? So things fail, I love it. And then I, the, these experiences happen and I, I'm attached. And so like that flower just means so much to me at a time that um, I was going through some really dark things with like racial experiences. And so, um, yeah, I put them on, on my pieces as well. Here and there, not as often, but they do show up sometimes. I was in Charleston two years ago, maybe, and uh, saw the sweet grass baskets for the first time and, and also took an a, um, alternative tourist tour of the Gullah um, sites and the history and it was fascinating and so I'm, I'm very interested in um, Ashlyn's attachment to that and her your own personal history about that so um, that's that's really amazing I'm so glad to hear about it oh great hi Tony <laughs> I would just say that this was great doing this for us uh, very informative and a whole new uh, understanding of your work so it's been fabulous wonderful
And yeah, if you you see me around and you were you you have another question, just stop me. I'm here to answer them. I like talking about the work, so I don't mind ever just stopping and answering. Okay. And Ashlyn, we absolutely love that about you. <laughs> well, I'm glad, Kai. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this tonight, Ashlyn. I know, I, I know that I appreciate learning more about your work all the time and getting a chance to see you do it from uh, point A to point B is also just really wonderful. Thank you, Ashlyn. You're very welcome. Thank you, Ashlyn. You're Thank welcome. you, that was great. You're so welcome. Thank you, Ashlyn. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank great. you, it was wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yeah. It was great. Thanks for doing it, Kyla. Yeah.